we are recording, Chair Duran. Um, and I do see uh, Trustee Noel, Trustee Broughton, and Trustee Good. Oh, there's Trustee Good. Just waiting for Trustee Noel and, oh, there's Trustee Broughton. Just Trustee Noel. Good morning still, Trustee Noel, Greg Noel, if you're there, just let us know by activating your camera. Yes, yes, no, no, I'm here. I'm trying to get my camera on. Right on. But I'm here and ready to go. Super, glad to hear it. I'm gonna bang the gavel and call the meeting of the Board of Trustees of the State Bar to order. Uh, this is the regular board meeting, May 18th, 2023. Thank you all for your patience as uh, our committees made their way through some very important business and discussion this morning. We're happy to see many, many more people around the table and in the room uh, to participate in this, what appears to be a very full agenda. I'm looking forward to some robust discussion and from hearing from many, many different perspectives today. Uh, we are called to order. May I have a roll, please? Broughton. Present. Buenaventura. Present. Chen. Present. Cisneros. Here. Duran. Present. Good. Here. Noel. Here. Shelby. Present. Sowell. Present. Stallings. Present. Tony. Present. You have a quorum. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Next on the agenda is a call for public comment. State bar staff will attempt to call members of the public in the order that they appear in the attendee pool. For those of you who are participating by Zoom video, you should have a function for virtually raising your hand. It is a hand icon and should appear at the bottom center of your screen. If you wish to address the board, please click on the hand icon now and State Bar staff will add you to the list of members of the public wanting to give comment. If you're participating by phone, you may virtually raise your hand by pressing star nine, that is a star key and the number nine. Again, doing so will alert staff that you would like to make a comment and State Bar staff will call upon you and open your microphone so that you can address the committee. Uh, as I've mentioned, we do have a very full agenda today. So due to time limitations and restrictions, we're gonna limit public comment to three minutes per speaker. Please note that staff will have an on-screen countdown timer visible to all attendees during the duration of your public comment. The timer's three minute countdown will begin as soon as you start your comment. The on-screen timer will flash throughout the final 10 seconds and you may get a verbal uh, one minute or 30 second warning depending on how alert uh, we are up here. I would like to start with our first speaker, and I apologize if I mispronounce the last name, Gil Pelez. Mr. Pelez, are you with us this morning? Yes, hello, can you hear me? We can. Yes, we can. Okay, great. I'm, I'm a member of the Los Angeles County Bar Association Future of Lawyering Committee, and I'm speaking today regarding item 701, the BRC report on the California Bar Exam and to highlight one portion of the report that virtually every stakeholder in California opposes, the elimination of three key foundational subject areas from the bar exam, family law, estates, and business law. As you know, 27 bar associations joined a letter opposing certain portions of the BRC report, including the elimination of these three topics, and also opposing a non-exam option to bypass the bar exam. The bar associations that joined collectively represent well over 100,000 practitioners, including every major county in California and minority and public interest bar associations. This represents the largest coordination of California bar associations on any issue to date. In addition to the 27 bar associations, more than 800 people wrote public comments with a vast majority specifically opposing the elimination of these three foundational topics. The public comments included law school faculty and public interest groups. Importantly, not a single stakeholder wrote in support of the elimination of these three foundational topics. And for good reason, every Californian is impacted by family law, estate law, and business law. A reduction of practitioners in these areas will hurt the most vulnerable members of the public. Sadly, the Blue Ribbon Commission conducted only a few minutes of discussion about the elimination of these topics, which was approved because it was part of a 2018 attorney practice study. That study was deeply flawed because it did not consider the effects on the public when it suggested, among other recommendations, that the bar exam might be able to reduce topics. Importantly, the study was superseded by a comprehensive 2020 New York study, which found that eliminating these same topics from the New York bar exam in 2016 
harm the public in many significant ways, and that the most vulnerable members of the New York now have less options for vital practices as family law or state law. After eliminating these topics in 2016, New York is now planning to put them back on the bar exam. Why would California want to make the same mistake that New York is now regretting? What exactly is the benefit to the public in removing these topics? The bar associations recognize that a certain part of the bar exam, specifically the multiple choice section, should be replaced. As the New York study found, the MBE multiple choice section, which is controlled by the NCBE, a private corporation, is the main culprit for low pass rates and desperate minority pass rates, and not the state-controlled written essay portion of the exam that includes state law subjects. In fact, after New York removed the state law subjects and gave greater control to the NCBE, pass okay. rates declined in New York. So not only did the removal of these topics result in less qualified attorneys, but pass rates also declined. Therefore, replacement of the NCBE multiple choice section should be the focus of reforming the exam. This is exactly what New York is doing today, and I encourage the State Bar to work together with, it, with its New York counterparts. I urge the board to listen to the opinion of every major stakeholder and retain family law, business law, and estates on the bar exam, or at least suspend this recommendation until further study can be conducted. Thank you, and I appreciate your time. Thank you, Mr. Pillars. Just a very brief housekeeping note here. I have a list of some 16 people who have signed up to speak at the board meeting in advance of today's meeting. Our secretary has been kind enough to provide me that list so that I can pretend like I know what's going on here in terms of scheduling. Uh, we do recognize that there are folks who have joined us here in person. There may be some overlap between that list and uh, folks who've signed up here in person. And finally, we know that there are people who have signed up on the spot today to speak with us. Uh, virtually. And so we're going to accommodate all of the speakers, uh, starting with the folks who have signed up early on my list. I'll move over to the folks who are here in the room and signed up to speak in person. And then finally, the clerk, uh, the secretary, pardon me, will uh, call the folks who are wanting to speak virtually. So just so everyone uh, has a sense of where we're going. I'm also going to try to um, give a couple of advance notice so you know your turn is coming up. So next we have Lorena speaking, and then Jean Cha and Peter Madura. So uh, we will activate Lorena's mic if they are ready. Uh, good morning, dear esteemed members of the Board of Trustees. I hope you can hear me. We can. My name is Lo Thank you. My name is Lorena Peñalosa. I come to you to comment on item 703, the proposed changes to rules 7.52 and 7.60. I am a current member of the Jenny Commission. I concur with the written statement submitted by Justin Palmer, current chair of the commission, a statement submitted after a unanimous vote by the commission. I also concur with the statement of former Jenny Chair Stella Nye, Jody Nunez, David Fu, and Avinder Singh. Today, however, I come to speak on my own behalf. I come to you concerned and disappointed today because the changes that are being proposed seek to undermine the incredible strides this board has made to advance the principles of diversity, equity, and inclusion within Jenny. From peeling away the veil of secrecy that used to plague the identity and process of Jenny to diversifying the membership of the Jenny Commission. These changes have played a part in advancing a bench that strives to reflect the population of California. I believe DEI work is a work in progress, especially when it comes to diversifying our bench. My hope is that this board is committed to the notion that a commitment to DEI does not have to be a direct charge by rule or regulation or a category to check off a list. Instead, I hope you share my belief that the commitment to DEI means understanding that to advance DEI, we must see our systems, including proposed changes to it through the DEI lens. And this is what the proposed changes fail to do. The report indicates that there has been significant dialogue with the commission. Except for the session referenced in the report, I am unaware of any significant dialogue by staff with the members of the commission regarding the proposed changes, and certainly not prior to proposed changes being introduced in March. A failure to consult with the diverse voices of the members of the commissions, those who devotedly volunteer hundreds of hours to do this work and know this work intimately, prior to introducing the changes being proposed at all, misses the mark in advancing inclusivity. Speaking more specifically to the proposed change to rule 7.60, I strongly oppose removing the requirement of an in-person meeting for Jenny. The report represents that a streamlined reporting process has been adopted to allow for the increased volume of work being handled by this group of volunteers. It is silent on the investigations themselves. Because while the reporting process may be more streamlined, it does not reflect the substantial effort, hundreds of hours and work handled by commissioners, not only before the commission meeting, but during the meeting and in between. It does not describe the additional time commitment these volunteer commissioners have had to take on in, in advance of the meeting to try and make the streamlined process work. What is described as socializing minimizes the value of the candid dialogue that takes place in, in person among commissioners. 
The in-person interaction and engagement of commissioners goes a long way to allowing commissioners the opportunity to get to know each other. Their respective values, building trust. Building distrust allows the commissioners to have honest conversations during implicit bias training, and more importantly, conversations about candidates. I dare to say that the ability to build these relationships carries a heightened importance in an environment where the reporting is substantially streamlined. The report alludes to a shift in some of its proposals, such as abandoning for the time being a hybrid Friday, Saturday schedule. However, allowing the rule changes to go forward opens the door to the implementation of a similar or different change in the future with little to no consultation. Thank you, Ms. Banyolosa, for your comments and thank you for your service on Jenny. Next, we have Jean Cha. We do not see Jean Cha in attendance. Okay, Peter Maruda, please. Uh, we also do not see Peter Maduro in attendance. Next, we have Claire Solat, who will be followed by Susan Bakshian and then Corey Weber, please. Good morning. Just checking the microphone. Is everything working properly? Yep. Yes. Thank you so much. My name is Claire Solat, and I represent the Legal Services Funders Network. Over the past two years while attending BRC meetings, I noticed that the tenure of the meetings changed when alternative licensure was discussed. Rather than working collaboratively with others and keeping an open mind, several members of the commission took steps to thwart the process and shut down exploration of alternatives. The anti-exploration faction time and time again disregarded comments and data provided by experts who confirmed alternative licensure methods can be used to assess minimum competency and protect the public made decisions based on their opinions and personal agendas, and attempted to argue that alternative licensure methods would negatively impact diversity and put participants at risk of harassment, discrimination, and poor supervision. These same commissioners attempted to influence their constituencies by sharing misleading information about the levels of potential risks associated with alternatives and used inaccurate terms such as non-exam. Many of the comments you received from bar commissions sadly were impacted by these false narratives. As outlined in Professor Debra Merrick's written public comment, which you received earlier this week, California's PLP and PLL programs have increased attorney diversity, increased access to justice for low and middle income individuals, and have not led to higher rates of harassment or discrimination. Sadly, the anti-exploration faction appears to have been most interested in protecting themselves and their turf. While they voted not to explore alternatives, at the same time, they authored and voted for motions that would make it easier for them to obtain licenses to practice law in other states. As noted in the BRC report, the composition of law students and bar examinees has changed dramatically. Representation by non-whites, second career folks and parents has doubled. Standard bar examinations were designed for affluent young unencumbered examinees. First time pass rates for BIPOC examinees are 20 to 50% lower than their white classmates. As noted recently by the American Bar Association, socioeconomic status is the biggest factor when it comes to passing the bar exam. Alternative pathways to licensure are not easier or less capable of determining competency. Licensure alternatives allow new lawyers to earn a living and get real hands-on experience immediately after completing law school, will help with the recruitment of new and diverse public interest attorneys, reduces the impact of socioeconomic differences on licensure rates and offers a well-needed option for those with disabilities and or caregiving responsibilities that impact both the day of exam experience and preparation. The LSFN urges the Board of Trustees at this time to recommend exploration of an alternative pathway to licensure by reaffirming its December 2022 recommendation to the California Supreme Court to immediately pilot an alternative pathway to licensure using the 2020 PLLs and to work towards offering an alternative pathway to licensure to new law school graduates by 2025. Finally, with regards to the fee adjustments that are currently under consideration. Sorry, your time is up. Thank you, Ms. Solat. Next, we have Susan Bakshian, please. Thank you. You can hear me? Yes, yes we can. Thank you. My name is Susan Bakshian, and I'm a member of the Blue Ribbon Commission on the Future of the Bar Exam the commission that prepared the report you are now considering. I'm also a professor at Loyola Law School. Today, I comment only in my capacity as an active member of the California Bar. I would like to make three quick points. Initially, I would like to ask the board to closely review the public comments submitted by Professor Deborah Merritt. 
She was one of the experts who spoke to the Blue Ribbon Commission and her insights respond to much of the misinformation circulating about bar exam alternatives. Also, I would like to highlight two main points about the Commission's report. First, I would like to speak in favor of the suggested changes to the bar exam, including moving to an emphasis on the skills actually required to be a competent new attorney, moving away from memorization of black letter law and reducing the number of subjects tested on the exam. A true test of competence should do no more than what is necessary to ensure that a new attorney is fit to practice. This does not mean an attorney is fit to practice in any particular specialty or area of practice, or even that the attorney knows every law they might encounter as they enter the profession. The removal of specialized subjects such as trusts, wills, business associations, and community property is a step in the right direction. A competent attorney does not rely on a rule memorized in law school. We should stop testing with that memorization emphasis and focus on true competence, practice skills, knowledge of basic subjects, and the ability to apply legal analysis. The public is best protected by an exam that is more focused on what the national and California surveys show today's young lawyers are actually doing, not what lawyers who took an exam many years ago remain wedded to. The commission got this right, and I encourage the board of trustees to recommend the suggested reforms to the exam. But the commission failed to come to consensus on my second point. My second point is this, California needs to pursue an exploration of exam alternatives. The commission was closely split. A logical response to such a close vote should be to continue to evaluate options, not to foreclose them. This is especially true as here, where unfortunately some members of the commission failed to attend the meetings on video and voted without participation in the discussions about point. exam alternatives. The public could see this lack of this action as lack of openness to alternatives and disconnection from the process as a predetermined response, which is of course improper on any commission charged with evaluating best practices and options. Some commission members comments show the close vote was also fueled by misinformation about exam alternatives, misinformation that came from the public and even from a member of the commission. I ask this board to do better. Thank you, Professor Bakshian. Our next three speakers are Corey Weber, Rianne Pacheco, and Selena Copeland, please. Uh, Mr. Mr. and Ms. Weber, thank you. Corey Weber should have the mic. Um, just need to unmute. Corey. Hi, this is Corey Weber. Can you hear me? Yes, you yes, can. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for the time to address you today. Uh, I'm a current member of the Gini Commission, but my comments here are as in an, in an individual. Uh, Chair Palmer has already submitted a letter that reflects uh, the views of the Gini Commission. I think it's important to note at the outset that all of the constituencies, those both proposing and commenting on the proposed rule changes, share the same common goals. We want to have a Gini Commission that's fair to the judicial candidates. We want to ensure that the Gini Commission is able to investigate and deliberate in a manner that promotes a judiciary of quality and integrity. We also want to ensure that diversity in the judiciary continues to be an important consideration and that we don't become complacent based on recent gains in diversity. The proposed modifications to Rule 7.60 have the potential to dramatically impact our shared goals for Ginny. The proposed change would remove the requirement that Ginny meetings take place in person. Although a potential shift to Zoom is not imminent, there would be nothing preventing that from occurring at any point in the future. I'd like to reiterate what other people have said, the Ginny meetings taking place in person is absolutely critical to Ginny's mission. Judicial candidates deserve to have a fair process where each of the candidates is given the consideration, discussion, and deliberation they deserve. That means having those discussions in person rather than in Zoom boxes where people may be multitasking or attention may be waning after a number of hours, given that Ginny meetings are fairly lengthy. 
There are also deliberative discussions that it can only take place in person based on mutual trust and respect after commissioners build personal relationships, something that only happens at in-person meetings. That includes commissioners feeling able to question other commissioners' thinking or assumptions and to have an honest discussion. The same type of discussion is not going to be had by Zoom without personal relationships having been built. By permitting a shift to remote meetings, we place at risk becoming complacent and ensuring that diversity is not only important, but a critical part of our state, country, and judiciary. Without the personal relationships and discussions at in-person meetings, we may lose the type of frank discussions and addressing the implicit biases that lead to a deliberative process embracing diversity. Jenny commissions are, uh, commissioners are volunteers. We put in a lot of hours. It's an important role that we love doing. We want to make sure we honor the role and the trust that you put in us. The proposed rule changes need to be rethought. I'm sorry, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weber, and, and thank you as well for your service on Jenny. Rianne Pacheco, please. Uh, Good morning. Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good morning. Hi. Good morning. Board of Trustees, my name is Rianne Pacheco, and I'm with the Legal Aid Association of California. Thank you for the opportunity to comment today. Regarding item number 701, we strongly oppose the Blue Ribbon Commission's insufficient and insufficiently supported recommendation to explore a California-specific bar exam. Rather than exploring and, and oh sorry, rather than exploring any of the proposed alternative pathways for licensure to practice law. The commission included many people with expertise in testing, which unsurprisingly became their lens for the only pathway to licensure. As a representative of the legal aid community, a community that is directly affected by these recommendations, we strongly urge the Board of Trustees to create a new body made up of individuals from the access to justice and legal aid community. This body should look at ways the alternative pathways similar to provisionally licensed lawyers program would diversify and increase access to a legal aid attorney for millions of Californians who have legal problems every year. I yield the rest of my time to Selena Copeland. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pacheco. We, we won't be yielding time today. Every, every speaker will have three minutes unless there's a need for me to actually change that. I am looking forward to hearing from, from Ms. Copeland, uh, who is next. And after Ms. Copeland, we've got David Fu and Stella Nye. If I pronounce that inappropriately, I apologize. Good afternoon now. It's a little bit afternoon. Uh, Ms. Copeland, if you're ready, we are. Good afternoon. This is Selena Copeland. Um, and like Rihanna, I work at the Legal Aid Association of California, and we actually represent the more than 100 legal aid organizations funded by the State Bar. Um, and I want to speak very briefly on three different agenda items today. The first is in very strong support of item 704. Um, and this, these are the new rules um, related to Legal Services Trust Fund Program. And you'll see a presentation on that later, but we're in strong support of these changes. The next is on item 710 on the fee increases. Um, and, uh, we are in support of the State Bar staff's proposal to focus on increases in attorney special admissions. Um, and, and we re really appreciate the, I guess, moderate increases for, for other um, admission costs. One thing we would like to encourage the State Bar to consider is we hear a lot from legal aid organizations that they want to pay for a law study for their um, new hires. They wanna pay for the bar exam. They wanna pay for a lot of these fees, but they are too expensive for nonprofits to cover. So we would like the State Bar to consider scaling those fees if they are paid for by a nonprofit employer. And that's not part of the proposal, but we'd like you to consider it. And item number 605 is the last one. I, I wanna express a lot of um, gratitude for State Bar staff for withdrawing many of the proposals that we felt would be impossible for small MCLE providers to follow. Um, in the presentation that you'll see later today or, or perhaps tomorrow, um, you'll see there's, there were a lot of changes made that really reflected the public comments. And I just wanna thank State Bar staff for doing it because I know there were a lot of comments on these items. And I also appreciate a new item proposed, um, I think it's rule 3611. And this would um, scale MCLE provider fees for nonprofit and government MCLE providers. For, for many of us who do all of our trainings for free for legal aid attorneys or pro bono attorneys, we are not able to easily absorb increased fees because we don't charge for these trainings. So I wanna thank State Bar staff for proposed rule 3.611. Um, and also buried in there is rule 3601G around technology. And one of my concerns with adding a new technology MCLE um, component 
was marketing perhaps from um, you know, uh, other technology companies wanting to market their services and calling it MCLE. And I appreciate the specific language that says that marketing would not be considered MCLE for technology purposes. So um, thank you to State Bar staff for these changes. And um, that's, that's the end of my comment. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Copeland. David Fu, please. Good afternoon. My name is David Fu, and I am speaking today in respect to the opposition to the proposed Jenny rule changes. Thank you very much for the opportunity to address this board. Previously, I served as the 2012 chair of the real Pro or co-chair of the real property law section uh, prior to the time that the sections were disaggregated from the bar. In 2017, I had the pleasure of serving as the chair of Jenny. And currently I serve as one of the four attorney members appointed to the Judicial Council for which I thank this body for its confidence and the great honor of serving on the Judicial Council. I was a signatory to written comments, so I will tailor my time closely here. Those concerned in opposing these rule changes are aware of a number of rule and procedure changes enacted and others only proposed recently to the commission. None of the changes I am aware of have been for the betterment of the commission and its duties. Mm -hmm. Jenny's rules are codified under the government code, but many Jenny procedures are unwritten. Together, these rules and procedures are each based on time-tested principles, each designed to protect the integrity of the process. None are arbitrary. For example, at meetings, the chair and the vice chair conduct the candidate vote. They vote last. This is because no one member may exert influence, more influence than another over the body, and the chair may have outsized influence on the vote. This is avoided by voting last. The chair also avoids excessive comment at meetings for the same reason. The chair's job is to maintain efficiency and apply rules to guide the commission in the evaluation. It is not the chair's job to influence the outcome. The report is read at the meeting only. A report is never released to anyone else, and the only time a report is read to a candidate is when an NQ rating is reached, and then it is read only once over the phone and no copies are distributed. This is for the protection of raiders and commissioners alike against reprisal and other problems that could result from the release of that information. I understand that today, those reports are now distributed electronically. Also for the protection of the integrity of the process, the vote is tabulated, but the individual vote that is cast by whom is not recorded. Investigating commissioners may not disclose their participation in an investigation on any past, present, or future candidate ever. This also avoids reprisal and currying favor with potential uh, judicial candidates. There are many, many more procedures each designed to protect the process. You have 30 seconds remaining. My purpose here is not to ply you with Jenny Minutia. It's to make the point that the commission best knows what is and is not important to the commission. Recently, I was speaking with a superior court judge who told me that he thought that 90% of juries got the outcome right. That's because of the wisdom of crowds. If we give, we, we can do that because we give juries the opportunity to spend the time and to properly evaluate a very important decision. We would like for the commission to have that Sorry, role as well. Sorry, your time is up. If I could just make the, the last point I wanted to Go say. Ahead. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. The commission is in the best position to decide what things can be done to cut its expenses. And I had a conversation outside and proposed several things right away which would result in substantial savings in travel costs for the commission. I believe that what would be helpful in terms of our joint mission of public protection is to allow the commission to evaluate its finances and make the determination of what things can be done in order to recognize those savings. This will allow us to get the job done without deleterious impact to the impact or the emission of the commission. Uh, I thank you very much for this opportunity. I think that we're all here serving the same masters, serving the people of California. We want to see that done. And I can't imagine any greater public protection duty that this body holds than to properly and efficiently and thoroughly vet judicial candidates who will affect the lives of tens of thousands of people over their practice careers. Mr. Fu, thank you for joining us in person. Thank you for your past service on Jenny and your current service on the Judicial Commission. I appreciate you being here. Thank you very much. Okay, the next three speakers this afternoon are 
Stella Nye, Rick Gilbert, and Chaya Malik. Hello, I'm also here for item 703. My name is Stella Nye. I was Jenny Chair in 2021. I'm a proud former State Bar volunteer. The government code vests the Jenny Commission with responsibility for judicial evaluations. The changes in front of you today are not merely operational. They affect judicial evaluations, which are the province of the commission. Going forward, for any more changes and cuts to Jenny, I ask that you request that Jenny leadership present on those cut, cuts at the relevant board meeting. I've already written to you about DEI. I'll say that we know that an inclusive bench is not an accident. DEI takes intention every step of the way. You can't take your foot off the gas. It doesn't just matter at the very end at the appointment. The changes that have been implemented, the ones that are on the table, they are shortcuts. You can't take shortcuts to DEI. You can't cut your way to DEI. As for data, I'd welcome the chance to look at data alongside the state bar staff. I think it would serve the public to include those who have conducted Jenny investigations to be a part of decisions about which data to analyze. The vehicle to do this would be a task force to study the future of Jenny. It's important. All Californians should can be proud of this body that we have to evaluate judicial applicants. I hope the board is as well. Thank you very much. Ms. Knight, thank you for joining us and thank you for your past service on Jenny. Rick Gilbert, please. Good morning, am I dialed in? You are, sir. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm gonna apologize in advance, you're gonna hear some reputation, or pardon me, some repetition. Uh, just so you know, I'm a retired Superior Court judge. I had the privilege of serving on the Jenny Commission for an extended term, which went nearly four years, much to the chagrin of my colleagues and staff. Uh, respectfully, as I'll mention later in my comments, uh, my perspective on various proposals to change the Jenny rules may be in conflict with some of my uh, past Jenny colleagues and even currently serving members, and I'll circle back to that. I'm going to urge you to do something very similar to that which you've heard, which is to defer consideration of any changes to Jenny rules pending a short interactive process involving State Bar staff, current and former Jenny commissioners, to Jenny commissioners to come back to you with specific recommendations. Uh, Critically, it is essential that in that process that the state bar advise the participants in that process of what the budget reduction goals set by the state bar with respect to Jenny are, and then allow the, the involved constituents, stakeholders to bring back to you as the last speaker indicated a specific response to accomplish those goals. Let me give you some perspective on it because it's, it's influenced by two kind of what I'll call my personal realities. Number one, I'm old, and I'll come back to the significance of that in a moment. Number two, uh, a bit of wisdom that stuck with me uh, from a young lawyer uh, came from uh, dealing with a client representative back in the day who had a, a poster on the back of his office door, which was a beautiful bald eagle with talons outstretched about to seize its prey, and the caption was, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you. Let me explain. Uh, I come to this process with a perspective on the origin of the Jenny Commission, which I think, and with apologies, seems to be ignored. That history, interestingly, is recited on the State Bar website and points out that, you know, the State Bar Board of Trustees used to do evaluations informally, and then a commission was formed to take the workload off the State Bar Board of Trustees, and then the, the legislature codified that with the adoption of the Government Code Section 12011.5. That's not the whole story. The story is that in 1979, then Governor Brown went to Washington, rumored to be part of his nascent presidential campaign. And in his absence, Republican Lieutenant Governor Mike Kerb purported to make an appointment to the Second District Court of Appeals to replace the retiring presiding judge. As it turned out, uh, Governor Brown had already sent the name of Bernard Jefferson, yeah, Bernard Jefferson, to the Board of Trustees for review that resulted in litigation, which the Supreme Court took up and ruled on. Uh, and for those law wonks of you, 26 Cal 3rd 110. 
So the, the Supreme Court ultimately I'm decided sorry, that the Commission on Gen Thank you for your comments, Judge Gilbert, and thank you for your service throughout the state and your long history. Appreciate that. Chaya Malik or Malik, please. Chairman Duran, can you confirm that you can hear me? We can hear you, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Duran, for the opportunity to speak to you as well as the Board of Trustees. My name is Chaya Malik. I am Vice Chair of the Jenny Commission. I hadn't wanted to speak, but felt compelled to provide comments on State Bar Rules Proposals 7.52 and 7.60. I have relayed my comments directly to the State Bar staff, and thank you for the opportunity to relay them briefly to you. Recently, the Board of Trustees was presented with seemingly innocuous but unnecessary and restricting rule changes outside of the typical amendment cycle with the promise of even more changes in the future. These changes seem to limit the discretion of the commission to conduct its investigations, interviews, and provide reports. While the background and discussion to this item has changed given a broad expression of public comments expressing credible concerns with regards to diversity, equity, and inclusion, what remains is a recommendation to approve rule changes, removing the discretion to hold meetings in a manner that already exists in the rule. The changes to the background and discussion over the course of its introduction to now are indicative of the potential pernicious outcomes from these seemingly innocuous changes. I will add that statistics related to the efficacy of Zoom meetings of nearly 40 people can be sliced and diced to support an infinite number of views and belies what we know by common sense. There are no metrics that can really me measure the value of the discussion voting and independent evaluation afforded by a robust discussion of the commission. Presently, the Jenny Commission represents less than 1% of the state bar budget and is no stranger to cuts, already been burdened by a cut of nearly 70% of expenditures on the full volunteer workforce and recently shifting certain hotel costs to the volunteers. These unnecessary and seemingly innocuous rule changes enable future cuts before evaluating the impact of those changes and would result in the Board of Trustees sending a message to the Commission's volunteers and the State of California as to the lack of value of the Jenny process in supporting the governor and appointing diverse candidates to the bench. I hope you will reconsider and vote against these rule changes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Malik. Next on the list, the next three on the list rather, are Judge Brenda Harbin-Forte, Justin Palmer, and then a speaker whose last four digits are 0836. Judge Harbin Forte, good afternoon, welcome. Thank you, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to address you. I am a retired Alameda County Superior Court judge. I'm a current member of the Jenny Commission, a past chair of the State Bar's Council on Access and Fairness, a past chair of the court's working group of the State Bar's Diversity Pipeline Task Force, the past chair or planning committee member of the statewide judicial diversity summits that have been held every five years beginning in 2006. I've been passed and I'm, I'm current faculty for numerous programs on judicial diversity put on by the State Bar and other entities in this state and actually around the world. In short, Judicial diversity is my passion. That is what sparks joy. That is my commitment uh, and has been my commitment for more than 20 years. I believe that the proposed changes to rules 75.52 and 7.60 will be detrimental to the judicial diversity that this state is finally seeing uh, over, over the course of many, many years and much hard work. I want to, I don't want to repeat what has been said and I also submitted a letter. I don't want to repeat what has been said by others, but I do wish that the, that the board would consider a few things. With respect to particularly rule 7.60, I have searched long and hard through the staff memo and everything else and I do not see why there is a proposal uh, for 7.60, particularly given what I understand to be the uh, staff's movement away from, from asking for remote meetings. The Saturday, the Friday in-person, Saturday remote, remote, staff seems to have backed away from that. 
staff seems to have backed away from remote um, remote meetings, even if it moved to a Thursday, Friday uh, 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 schedule. So I don't understand the urgency or the need. Uh, the changes to Rule 7.60, in my view, seem to be a proposed fix in search of a problem. There is no problem. I will tell you as well that with respect to the changes, even in terms of remote meetings, if that's still on the table, when I joined the commission in 20, uh, 2021, we were all remote. We then moved to in-person meetings. There is a decided and distinct difference between in-person and remote meetings. There is much more exchange. There is much more evaluation uh, on some intangible levels that can't be captured in statistics and, and, and the items that are, have been identified in the staff reports. So I am going to urge you strongly to reject both of these um, the, those recommendations. There is no need to change 7.52. And particularly, even if you change 7.52. Thank you, Judge. We are, we are hesitant to, to cut any speaker off, uh, let alone someone of, of your uh, long tenured history and service. And really importantly, the joy and the passion that you bring and have brought uh, to all of your very diverse service. Thank you for your current service on Jenny. Uh, certainly would have been great to see you in person today. I, it's been a long time, so I hope you are well. Sorry for the editorializing. I don't often get to speak to Judge Hobbin Forte. Next is Justin Palmer, please, who is here in the room with us. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Chair. And the remaining Board of Trustees. Good afternoon again. Um, my name is Justin Palmer. I'm the current Chair of the Ginny Commission. I initially was not going to share comment. I didn't think it was appropriate. I think our position is well articulated in the letter that is submitted in your package. But um, my grandmother's 93rd birthday was yesterday. She would, have, she would have been 93 and she died in 2007. And she taught me a few things that I think will illustrate and are, that are germane to our discussion, but also will illustrate the points that I want to make. The first thing she taught me is the importance of gratitude and manners. And I want to thank each of you for giving me an opportunity to share our perspective uh, and the perspective of the 38 people that I serve on this commission with. Um, that opportunity is not lost on me, and I appreciate it. The second thing she taught me is the importance of people, impact, and trust. Um, the passion that you hear when we speak about Jenny, both contained in our letters and the comments today, I think illustrate that. Stats don't capture that. Statistics won't uh, share with you or evaluate the magic that's in the room when we're discussing candidates. And I tell people privately and in public, I became a better lawyer and a better person for having served on this commission. We are nothing without people, period. And the removal of an in-person requirement for our meetings strips away the trust that I build with commissioners in doing this work. And so for that reason, I urge you to vote against the proposed rule change. The, the third thing that she taught me is the value of duty and commitment. And because of that, I stand before you here. My duty compels me to speak. My duty compels me to discharge this volunteer function. My duty compels me to devote hours beyond my regular practice to do this work. Me and the remaining commissioners, we care about this work on behalf of the state bar and of the governor. We care about making a diverse bench that will have reverberating impact on their communities. And the commitment that we have to this body also commands, in my view at least, you rejecting the in-person requirement. Um, the more formal positions, again, are outlined in my letter to you, but I, I think you've heard credible concerns raised by myself and the remaining commissioners related to DEI. I think that's a reason to at least stop and reconsider. I've spoken with Mr. Stallings outside and Mr. Cisneros. I personally pledge my availability to help you solve this problem. I don't want to give you the impression that we are not unaware of the budgetary concerns that the state bar as a whole are facing. That is not lost on me and it's not lost on my commission. But these proposed changes, these are, these are not it. These are not the solution to fix that budget problem. I've given them my cellular phone. I'll give it to you. Call me anytime you want, and I will come back, take time off of work as I have today to help you solve this problem. With that, I yield the balance of my time, Mr. Chair. Thanks. 
Thank you, Mr. Palmer. Do we have a caller with 0836? Never thought I'd be a radio show host. We do not. Okay. I will move on to my list of other folks in the room. Michelle Pincus, please. Followed by Lisa Biggers. Just make sure your mic is activated so folks can hear you in the... Um, it's green now. Wonderful. Can, Thank you. Is it activated? Okay. Yes. Good afternoon. I am a current Jenny commissioner and I'm new to Jenny and I just wanted to make my public comment in regards to rule change, the proposed rule change 7.60. I reiterate and um, concur with the previous comments made both by Chair uh, Justin Palmer in what he said today and what uh, the letter sent to the board on our behalf and Vice Chair Chaya Malik and then my co-commissioners who've spoken today. Uh, my, my primary request and proposition is that we consider or that you consider uh, postponing a vote on these rule changes in regards to the in-person meetings to a later time after having an opportunity to discuss and review the budget and come up with other proposals besides these. My concern and the concern of my co-commissioners come regarding the proposed changes and that are exhibited by our passion about it are based largely in part on the fact that we are volunteers, that we are volunteers who, many of whom are government attorneys. We are not wealthy firm lawyers. We are not people with um, pro bono budgets. And we do this because we believe very strongly in the mission of Jenny, in particular, the quality of the bench and DEI concerns. Because the bench in the state of California, both in civil and criminal courts, affect all of us in the state of California. And our concern is that if the the proposed rule changes then with the suggestions made such as Thursday and Friday meetings or uh, Fridays in person and Saturdays in Zoom and all of those will change the availability of the people who can be on the commission, which means single mothers like myself couldn't do it. Many people of color and people of lower incomes who work government jobs couldn't do it because they can't take more days off of work. We already volunteer hundreds of hours of time. I've been a commissioner only since January of this year, and I've already put in over 100 hours in doing my Jenny investigations and participating in this committee. And I also have already personally learned the difference between in-person meetings and Zoom meetings. One of my co-commissioners, Corey Weber, who spoke today, was my co-commissioner on my first uh, candidate. and the difference between meeting him in person at the meeting and us talking and discussing our notes versus our communications on Zoom were critical and changed everything. And we're looking at hiring people who are gonna be making the decisions regarding our entire population and our entire state. That difference is critical. What we're doing is critical. I apologize, but your time is up. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Ms. Pinkus, and thank you for your service on, on Jenny recent though it is. Okay, we're gonna move next to others uh, online who have not signed up in advance. I don't know how many of those folks we have. I will look to the secretary and, and her team. Oh. Okay, Ms. Biggers, thank you for uh, being very flexible. Uh, we are uh, eager to hear from you. We'll let you know when your mic is activated. Uh, your mic is activated, Ms. Biggers. Um, no, I don't think that. Okay, it looks she... like we lost you. I know it's difficult to, to do this in, in transit sometimes, so please do, um, if you're able to join us again, we will be sure to pick you up. Next, we have Michael Sternberg. Mr. Sternberg, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chairman. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. 
Thank you. So as you know, I've been coming to public comment to discuss my concerns about the misconduct complaint process and the bar's refusal to take evidence or to investigate. Uh, I've made a lot of public comments recently at committee meetings today because the board's here. I do want to heap some praise on you, if I may. So I'd like to start off with Louisa. Uh, this is not my first battle with a government agency that refuses to enforce accountability. It almost never goes well or easily, but Louisa is a hidden gem, and I hope you keep her for a very long time. It's clear she's concerned about the public welfare. Uh, she's always fully engaged with me and with others that I know about, and um, I also want to appreciate Leah. I have not had a lot of communication with Leah other, other than one email, but it's clear that she's at least not vindictively interfering, which is what happens a lot in bureaucracies. So I hope that continues to go well and I get to learn more about her. I also want to praise the board for its recent press releases, um, acknowledging past indiscretions. I also recently discovered the public trust liaison. I don't know how long that's been going, but that seems to me like a very important step. With my remaining time, I want to talk about what I think is the ultimate problem here, which is the culture at the bar and a scheme of rules that allows for way too much discretion. So, for example, I've been complaining recently about Scott, Scott, excuse me, Scott Carp for bar number 274682, who's an in intake attorney or was when I filed my first complaints. I sent a letter to the board, as you know. I've already received my closeout letter, of course. They come quickly these days. Uh, it was written by Lawrence J. Dal Cerro, bar number 104342. And it goes on for eight pages, again, essentially refusing to address the fact that no evidence has been collected or taken, and no, no investigation was undertaken. And the gist of the letter seems to be quoting uh, Rule 2601, which basically gives them full discretion to do whatever they want, including refusing to investigate. So I would hope the board looks into changing that rule and taking away discretion, because you clearly have a gatekeeping problem there with the attorneys in that office. I'm almost out of time, so what I would like to do is say that I do know I'm going to go through this letter, I'm going to look at all these rules, I'm going to type up a response, I'm going to cite it to everything, I'm going to send it to the board, because I am aware already under one, uh, Rule 2201 that the Special Deputy Trial Council is subject, to the, thank you, is subject to the oversight of the Regulation and Discipline Committee. So I do appreciate how welcoming the committees have been and also the full board. I hope you will continue to work with me and look at those letters. And I know and trust that Louisa will continue to pass off, pass on information and not be a gatekeeper. So thank you very much for your time today and I wish you luck at your meeting. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Sternberg. We have a couple more people. Uh, next we have Andrea Brown. Ms. Brown, once your mic is activated, you'll have three minutes, please. Good afternoon, can you hear me? Yes, we can, good afternoon. Wonderful, my name is Andrea Brown. I'm a lifelong resident of California. I have served as a public defender in Alameda County for nearly 29 years, and I have proudly served as a member of the Jenny Commission for two years. I know far too well the importance of choosing a judiciary that is diverse, reflective, and competent. The, de the decisions that they make not only have a direct consequence on those before them, but collateral consequences of all of us as Californians. I am adamantly opposed to the proposed Jenny rule changes. I will focus my comments here. The report alludes to a shift in some of its proposals, such as abandoning for the time being a hybrid Friday-Saturday schedule. However, allowing the rule changes to go forward opens the door to the implementation of similar or different changes in the future with the little to no consultation. I note that the opposition to a task force, a strategy to facilitate consultation, does not inspire confidence that is there is there is a commitment to ongoing consultation regarding future changes. Many of the written comments that were submitted about the impact of this change could have on diversity of Jenny. So I will not repeat that comment, but I want to highlight that the impact, impact is not only on the racial, ethnic, and gender diversity of Jenny, but also the geographic diversity of Jenny, the diversity of the practice areas of Jenny. How does this systematic change alleviate diverse voices or advance inclusivity? 
I propose it does not. To this end, I urge you to vote against the proposed rule changes and thank you for the opportunity this afternoon to comment. Thank you, Ms. Brown, for joining us and for your service on Jenny. I believe we have one last speaker, two more speakers. Uh, next, we have Rosanna Vellen. Ms. Vellen, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. We can hear you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Rosanna Vellen. I'm a member of the State Bar of California, and I am a certified family law specialist. I am speaking today on behalf of the Family Law Executive Committee of the LA County Bar Association. We are very much opposed to the elimination of the community property portion of the California State Bar Exam. Um, it is our position that community property law affects many aspects of the lives of people that live and conduct business in the state of California outside just of the, of the context of a marital breakdown, including business formation, business dissolution, bankruptcy proceedings, and domestic violence cases. We believe it's extremely important for attorneys to have at least a basic knowledge of community property principles before they are allowed to practice in the state of California. Furthermore, we don't see the benefit of eliminating community property on the bar, which would in any way outweigh the huge potential detriment to the public if attorneys are allowed to practice without at least basic knowledge of the concepts and principles of California community property laws and principles. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bellin. Next, we have Benjamin Cohn. Hello. I am speaking against proceeding at this time on the testing accommodations rules revision initiative without amending those uh, rules recommended by the committee of bar examiners to address a few uh, fatal defects. The original proposal that went out for public comment was much worse than this one, to be sure. It would have made it worse than the current rules, but even though these uh, new ones have fixed some of the issues, the most important parts that many of the commenters have asked for reforms and improvement remedial to the current rules on are still absent. Uh, the most important one of those is a decision within two weeks of submission for the applicants, which is needed to give the applicants the assurance that they will need to start bar prep at a competitive time to other applicants, and so that, which is needed to have equal opportunity. Even if they get all their accommodations closer to the bar exam, they need to be, have been able to do a competitive bar prep. And that two-week response time is also needed in, to make sure they get a decision in time to appeal uh, even if they apply closer to the final filing deadline, which DOJ guideline says that they need to have until. Uh, and if they do apply earlier than that, uh, at least uh, 44 days before the first business day of the month of the exam, it's needed to make sure that one of the other proposals is feasible, uh, uh, which is 30 days to get the doctor's responsive expert documentation for a full completed appeal submission. The reason the working group gave that 14 days was necessary rather than 30 days was that 30 days from the final filing deadline would not uh, be possible to turn by the time of the exam, but this is, the applicants who apply early would get 30 days and then that would be solved by the continuation, which is already there, of the earlier of appeal deadline of the first business day of the month of the exam. So that was misunderstood. It, they, applicants would get 30 days if they applied 44 days before the deadline, and then less than that if they uh, applied closer to two, as long as they get two weeks uh, to a decision, which was the other part of the component. The rules still do not provide a hearing like uh, moral character, those who would be denied a moral character determination would get uh, for at least those applicants who appeal 
par partial denials and it can't be granted on the papers. And it still has an illegal exceptional needs standard instead of best ensures a level playing field, among other Are things in my written that? comments. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. We are aware that uh, we do have written comments from you or we can expect them. So I appreciate you taking the time. I will just do one last, last check to see if Ms. Biggers made her way back onto the phone. Um, we do not see her hand raised. Um, no, she is also not online. Okay. All right. So it is uh, coming up on 1240 well into the lunch hour. Um, and before I break for lunch, and I'll let you know when I uh, hope we can get back, you know, there's there's um, there's certainly a lot of very big and important things on, on this agenda that's clear from the public comment. Uh, and it's also clear from the public comment that um, we, we operate in a, a, a very good group of serving people. There's a lot of discussion about gratitude and manners and courtesy and, and many, many speakers have thanked us for the opportunity to, to address us. And um, certainly I think that the thanks goes the other way uh, in equal amounts, if not more. Uh, you have a right to address us. We are a public body here to serve you and the state. Um, and we look forward to public comment at every one of our meetings. And we appreciate the time and effort that you've taken to um, put forth cogent um, in passion, sometimes uh, input and comment. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're always going to agree, and, and that is one of the things that I appreciate about this board of trustees around the table and on the screen is that we all uh, know how to and look forward to engaging in respectful uh, conversations. And so I just want to say thank you all very much for starting us off uh, with what will be um, some important work later when we return from lunch, at which time I hope to be uh, 12, 15. So let's break for lunch until, um, excuse me, a quarter after one. Thank you all. Uh, we will resume the Board of Trustees meeting. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. We are a few minutes past 1.15. Uh, we have closed public comment, which takes us to item 10 on our agenda, the minutes of the March 16th and March 14th open session meetings. I believe there is a notation, and I'm going to ask the Secretary to tell me what the corrections are. Yes, um, the March 16th. And March 24 meeting minutes have been updated to rectify the inadvertent omission of trustee goods attendance. All right. I remember trustee good being there. If there are no uh, other changes to the minutes, may I have a motion to approve as amended. Stallings, so moved. Stallings made the motion. Second. Cisneros with the second. Roll call, please. Broughton. Uh, not, not present. Buenaventura. Aye. Chen? Aye. Cisneros? Aye. Good? Aye. Noel? Not present. Shelby? Present. Sowell? Present. Oh, wait, is Aye. A... Aye. Okay, thank you. Stallings? Oh. Oh, did you? Aye. Sorry. Oh, okay, <laughs> thank you. I didn't catch that. Uh, Stallings? Tony? Aye. Duran? Aye. Nine ayes, zero nays. Motion carries. Great. Thank you, everyone. We are hopeful that Trustees Broughton and Noel will join us momentarily uh, when we get to the business. I will uh, move into the chair's report, which will be brief. I know that we've got a full agenda. Uh, I'd, I'd like to let the board know that I'm going to make a referral to COPRAC uh, with, res with respect to exploring uh, the impacts and the effects of artificial intelligence in the provision of legal services in California. In the past several months, generative AI and language learning models have captured the world's attention. Of course, the legal profession is no exception. I've had several conversations with colleagues and friends uh, along these lines uh, as recently as two days ago, and it's already changed the way that many lawyers practice law. There are many possible benefits of AI including efficiencies and improved access to justice under the right conditions. There are also, of course, possible risks, including disclosure of confidential client information, inaccurate advice, 
AI hallucinations, which quite frankly scare me a little bit, and bias, not to mention who and how it will be held accountable for client and public harm. Given our public protection mission, of course, uh, these are no issues that we uh, cannot ignore. So to explore these and many others issues surrounding AI today, aligning with the recent approach taken with respect to Rule 8.3, I'm asking the com Committee on Professional Responsibility and Conduct, which as we know is charged with studying and providing consultation and assistance to the board on matters involving professional responsibility with exploring the use of and recommendations for regulation of AI in the legal profession. There's a little bit of a short timeline here I'm going to ask for, and that is by our November 2023 board meeting. I'm hoping that COPRAC should issue its recommendations, which may include practical guidance, perhaps an advisory opinion or other resources, perhaps changes to the rules of professional conduct or other rules or statutes, or other recommendations to ensure that AI is used competently and in compliance with the professional responsibility obligations of lawyers. Um, and, and I do that uh, understanding that it is a, a heavy lift and with thanks in advance to the members of COPRAC and uh, the staff who supports them for their work on this very interesting issue. The other quick announcement I'd like to make is uh, I believe several of the trustees have been informed through our regular uh, updates that the committees, uh, the Judiciary Committees in both the Senate and the Assembly have invited uh, members of the State Bar leadership along with others um, interested in the, the, the very um, troubling issues that we have brought to the fore with respect to the Girardi matter and the investigation um, to a joint hearing in front of those two committees next Tuesday in the legislature. Uh, actually, I think it's in the flex space, not in the Capitol itself, uh, because of the size of the room that we need. That will happen uh, from 1.30 until we're told later in the afternoon, perhaps 4 or 4.30. Uh, I would certainly uh, welcome and encourage uh, any and all of the trustees to attend that hearing in person if you can. Um, certainly, it, um, it cannot hurt to show that we are uh, a united uh, body in support of the public protection mission of our organization and also um, very willing to have the conversation with the stakeholders uh, in the legislature with um, others who are uh, rightly concerned about what we have uh, uncovered and exposed and how we, more importantly, how we're addressing it as an agency. And so uh, I look forward to seeing those of you who are able to make it there. Um, and I look forward to the conversation with our legislative partners in, uh, in those respective committees. That is all I have to report. I'll turn it over to the executive director, please. Hi, I also have a, a very brief um, report, really wanting to um, thank and recognize our gem, Luisa and um, Alfredo for, and lift up some of the work that they've been doing behind the scenes to further enhance our public access uh, here to State Bar meetings. You may have seen outside when you walked in, there was a laptop set up that laptop is um, is a place where folks who attend our meetings in person can access a survey about their experience uh, at the meetings and coming to make public comment. Similarly, for all of the many people that sign up to make public comment or watch the meeting by Zoom, as soon as they log off of the meeting, they're receiving a survey about their experiences. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work to really ensure that the experience of the public, uh, whether it be in person here at our meetings or remotely is uh, seamless and that they do have access to all of the material and the ability to make comments in a way that is meaningful. Um, and we have been collecting many stats on participation um, and a number of other issues and most recently shared those uh, with Senator Laird staff. Senator Laird is carrying a bill that will allow the Board of Trustees and other state bar entities to continue to meet in hybrid remote fashion um, in perpetuity. And so we've been sharing kind of our best practices on um, this type of work. So wanted to recognize Louisa and Alfredo who've really led that charge um, and also just to let the board know it's something going on that you don't necessarily have a window into. Thank you. You're here. <laughs> I, I totally agree and thank you. Thank you both on behalf of the bar, on behalf of the board, excuse me. 
Okay, uh, we are going to move on to the consent calendar. Before we take the consent calendar up, I've been uh, informed by staff that there was a request to remove one item from our 700 series uh, later in the agenda into the consent calendar. That item is item 704 uh, and to make it item 50-8. I will give you a chance to scroll down in your agenda so that you can uh, take a look for yourself as to what item that is. Um, and if the board is amenable to that inclusion, I will need a second a motion and a second um, to add it into the consent calendar. And then we will consider the con consent calendar as one, uh, as one large item. Motion by Cisneros, I believe, second by Stallings. Can we have the vote on the inclusion of 50-8 into the consent calendar? Mr. Chair, before the vote transpires, can you provide reasoning as to why the change? I will turn that over to staff. Thank you. Sure. This is um, an item um, seeking the board's approval of rule changes to various uh, rules impacting the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission grant allocation work. And as outlined in that agenda item, the board does not actually have discretion vis-a-vis -vis, um, its action to approve these rules. The board's discretion has been statutorily limited to a very narrow set of circumstances uh, where the commission was acting in a way that was not in alignment um, with statutes or rules. OGC has done the requisite analysis of what is being proposed. And as outlined in the item, there is no basis for the board not to approve the rules. And so I think going forward, it would probably be a best practice for these items to always be on your consent agenda unless OGC has flagged an issue that would require it to come off. So that's all. We've probably taken more time on it now than um, than the presentation itself. I was just hoping to save a little a little time there. Excuse me, Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Uh, this is uh, this is Greg Noel. I'm um, I have to recuse myself from all participation on this item. Uh, <clears throat> um, uh, due to a financial interest, and I'm going to uh, mute myself. And uh, maybe Louisa can uh, text me when it's time for me to come back. Before you do that, Trustee you know, let me just confirm with our general counsel, because the item has now been moved into consent, it's my understanding that your uh, recusal can be noted for the record, uh, but you can participate in the remainder of the consent calendar should you so choose. I'll ask Eileen to confirm that. That is correct, Chair. However, the first motion before the board is to whether or not to include uh, this item into consent. <laughs> and so, but but I have reviewed the the rules a little bit more closely. Trustee, no, you do not need to leave the room for this uh, participation. Just uh, recuse yourself from voting, but you can stay on. Okay. Okay. Yes. So to recap, we will have uh, what I anticipate two votes. The vote right now, uh, if Trustee Shelby's question has been answered to her satisfaction, is to add fifty dash eight <laughs> into the consent calendar. We're good to take that vote. Anyone else have any commentary or discussion on the moving it into the consent calendar? I just would probably note from a procedural standpoint, moving forward, I, I imagine it was just a timing issue as it relates to this time, and so hopefully moving forward, it will be addressed. Yep, I, I think you. that's probably the case. Thank you, Trustee Shelby. Okay, we'll have a roll call on uh, the movement into the consent calendar. Broughton? Not present. Buenaventura? Aye. Chen? Aye. Cisneros? Aye. Good? Aye. Noel? Noel is recused. Noel is recused. Thank you. Shelby? Aye. Sowell? Aye. Stallings? Aye. Tony? Aye. Duran? Aye. So that's eight ayes, zero nays. Motion carries. Thank you, Madam Secretary. It moves us to the consent calendar. Does any member of the board wish to pull an item from consent for a separate discussion? I don't see any here in the room or any on the Zoom. With that, may I have a motion to, can prove the, to approve the consent calendar with the addition of 50.8. Motion by Stallings. Second. Second by Buenaventura. May I have the roll call, please? Broughton, not present. Buenaventura? Aye. Chen? Aye. Cisneros? Aye. Good? Aye. Noel? Oh. Noel is recused. Noel, um, oh, I'm sorry. Noel, uh, excuse me. Trustee Noel 
Uh, would you like to offer a vote on the rest of the consent calendar? Yes, uh, I am refusing myself from the 704 move to 50.8, and uh, but otherwise, I approve the uh, motion. Thank you, sir. Shelby, aye. Sowell, aye. Stallings, aye. Tony, aye. Duran, aye. Ten ayes, zero nays. Motion carries. With one recusal on 50 8. Yes. Okay, that moves us to the portion of our meeting designated uh, where the board is sitting as the regulation and discipline committee. Our first item is 60 1 proposed new rule of professional conduct governing attorney reporting requirements, rule 8.3. This is a return from public comment and a request for approval. This item will be presented by program director Erica Doherty who I think will join us on the screen shortly. Good afternoon, Ms. Doherty, welcome. Good afternoon, Chair Duran. Can everyone hear me okay? Yep. Okay, wonderful. I'm going to share some slides, so bear with me for one moment while I get those loaded. Okay, and hopefully you can see those as well. There they are, yes. Great, okay. So uh, good afternoon. Uh, this presentation is going to address proposed new rule of professional conduct 8.3, which if adopted would require a lawyer to report certain conduct of another lawyer if that conduct is known by the reporting lawyer um, with sufficient credible evidence. So there we go. All right, so a brief reminder of how we got to where we are today. So at the November 2022 meeting, uh, Chair Duran directed COPRAC to prepare a proposed rule of um, professional conduct addressing a lawyer's duty to report misconduct. In um, COPRAC's consideration, they were asked to consider ABA model rule 8.3, um, the adoption of that rule by um, various other jurisdictions, as well as past consideration of the model rule and any version of 8.3 by um, the Commission for the Revision of the Rules of Professional Conduct. Very shortly thereafter, Senator Umberg introduced Senate Bill 42, which would establish a statutory duty to report by adding a new Business and Professions Code section, section 6090.8. And if that's adopted, um, a licensee would be required to make a report to the state bar, essentially in a manner that is identical to ABA model rule 8.3. That is if the lawyer knows that another licensee has engaged in professional misconduct that raises a substantial uh, raises a substantial question as to that licensee's honesty, trustworthiness, or fitness as an attorney in other respects. So um, what occurred there is COPRAC issued a draft proposed rule 8.3 in January for a 30-day public comment period and held a public hearing. Following revisions based on that public comment period in the hearing, uh, COPRAC approved a proposed Rule 8.3 for submission to the Board of Trustees, and that was presented to you at the March 2023 meeting. That version, the COPRAC's version, just for ease, is going to be referred to as Alternative 1 during this presentation. In addition to Alternative 1, staff presented an um, Alternative 2 version, which is slightly broader than Alternative 1, and um, asked for the Board to issue those two for a uh, public comment period. Along with the public comment on the two alternatives, staff also requested input from commenters on whether they would prefer model rule 8.3 or no version of 8.3 in California. So a brief high level comparison of the ABA model rule and the two alternatives. So ABA model rule 8.3 and what is currently proposed in SB 42 require reporting of any violation of the rules of professional conduct that raise a substantial question as to the lawyer's honesty, trustworthiness, or fitness as a lawyer in other respects. Alternative one is the narrowest of the two alternatives, and it requires the reporting of criminal acts, fraud, or misappropriation of funds or property that would violate rule 1.15. Um, all of these types of conduct that must be reported only have to be reported in alternative one, if the conduct raises a substantial question as to the lawyer's honesty, trustworthiness, or fitness as a lawyer. Alternative two is slightly broader, and it would require the reporting of criminal acts that reflect adversely on a lawyer's honesty, trustworthiness, or fitness, and then also requires reporting of conduct involving dishonesty, fraud, deceit, or reckless or intentional, intentional misrepresentation, or misappropriation of funds or property. So just as a reminder, we talked about this in March, but um, alternatives one and two are identical except for what must be reported. And alternative one as presented is narrower than what must be reported in alternative two. 
The rules also have the same exceptions um, and the same knowledge standard. So um, the knowledge that triggers a duty to report is uh, known credible, credible evidence of certain conduct. Um, a lawyer can still report other violations, and that's clear in the rule that they may report. They're just only required to report certain conduct. The rules address the timing of when conduct must be reported. And there's also exceptions provided in the rule and in the comments regarding information gained in a substance use or mental health program and other information that may be protected by confidentiality, privilege, or other rules or laws. So diving into the public comment that was received when this was issued. So the state bar received 390 public comments on the proposals. The majority of the commenters disagreed with moving forward with any version of rule 8.3. That was 199 out of 390. Nearly all of those were attorneys. Of those who are um, in favor of moving forward with a version of rule 8.3, 84 preferred alternative one. Again, that was mostly attorneys. 66 pre preferred alternative two also mostly attorneys, just because most of our commenters were attorneys here, and then 41 prefer model rule 8.3. Um, so like I said, most of the comments we received were from attorneys. It was 84% um, of the total comments were provided by attorneys and 16% by non-attorneys or those who declined to state whether or not they are attorneys. And then of the attorney commenters, 58% oppose any version of 8.3. And then from uh, most in favor to least, it went alternative one, alternative two, and then the model rule. So essentially they preferred the most narrow version and least preferred the broadest version of the rule. Of the non-attorney commenters, 89% want a version of rule 8.3 and prefer what's an alternative two. Then they prefer model rule 8.3 and then followed um, finally with the most narrow version in alternative one. So what the commenters who oppose either um, essentially any version of 8.3 say is that um, the rule will be weaponized, particularly against attorneys of color, women, and solo and small firm attorneys. Um, they suggested that a, a attorney should be able to report anonymously and that there should be exceptions to the duty to report based on possible threats or retaliation. Um, many commenters said that the requirement to report under 8.3 is a re reaction to the May and Lazar reports, as well as the um, handling of the Thomas Girardi complaints. And they are concerned that it's going to open the floodgates for complaints that are filed with OCTC and kind of overwhelm the discipline system. They also said that it's not going to um, protect the public or enhance public trust in the legal profession because it will discourage lawyers from reaching out to others to um, you know, try and determine what they should be doing under the rules of professional conduct. It could cause conflicts between the lawyer and client um, and their attorney-client relationship. Um, and it'll basically take time away from lawyers because they'll be dealing with filing complaints or responding to complaints, um, as well as it could increase costs to um, clients because uh, most lawyers have a obligation to report to their malpractice carriers when a complaint is filed, which could result in an increase in insurance rates that's passed through to the clients. Finally, they said that there's a better way to handle this, which is on education regarding professional responsibilities and then also informing the public more about how they can report against a lawyer. A summary of the support positions is that lawyers have a moral duty to report misconduct and that they're in a better position to understand and know when a lawyer has committed misconduct versus a client or the general public. Um, they suggest that the rule will create a heightened disincentive for engaging in misconduct because a lawyer knows that they're more likely to be reported based on 8.3 and that it'll help a lawyer because the lawyer will now have to report versus feeling like they may, they, they may not want to because they were, no, they were previously not obligated to do so. Many of those in favor of a rule 8.3 rejected the opposition's argument that California is uniquely litigious um, and said that even if, even if so, bad actors are bad actors that should be reported. Um, and then to um, combat some of the concerns that were raised regarding weaponization of the rule, they suggest that existing rules and statutes should be enforced to um, discourage weaponization of the rule, including Rule 310, which um, prohibits the threatening uh, to file a complaint to gain advantage in a civil dispute, as well as um, criminal penalties for false and malicious reporting under um, Business and Professions Code 6043.5. In regards to the alternatives themselves, uh, so many of the proponents of alternative one said that it's appropriately limited to egregious misconduct and it's less likely to be weaponized. 
And then just more generally, they said it was easier to follow and understand than alternative two or model rule 8.3, as far as a lawyer's obligations for what they must report. Proponents of alternative two so that it's more broad than alternative one, and it should be because it deals with um, other instances that can frequently result in client and public harm. Um, and it also addresses the varieties of misconduct that can occur in many different practice areas beyond those which are more addressed by alternative one, which basically relates to the handling of money in most instances. Um, another thing regarding alternative two, as many proponents said that it kind of struck an appropriate balance between the model rule and alternative one. And then proponents of model rule 8.3 basically said that alternative two was close. So you may as well go all the way to model rule 8.3, primarily for consistency with other jurisdictions. And some commenters said that any violation of the rules should have to be reported regardless of how minor. So I can pause there for a second and answer any questions or I can go into some of the questions that were presented at the March meeting by the trustees that you asked me to look into and address those now. Thank you, Ms. Doherty. Let me check the room and then the Zoom to see if there are questions. I don't see any here in the room. Trustees so well, Noel Broughton, if you're with us. Don't hear anything, so please uh, proceed. Okay, so um, some of the questions that were presented by certain trustees at the March meeting was, were um, how would a lawyer comply with their obligation if 8.3 was ultimately adopted? And that staff is proposing that it would be the same process as anyone who currently files a complaint so they would use, you know, they can use the online complaint form and, or submit a written complaint. Um, lawyer filed complaints are already tracked by OCTC. And if adopted, staff will explore further ways to track this um, to address any concerns regarding um, more filings based on Rule 8.3. As far as potential discipline for a violation of Rule 8.3, uh, violations of the rules of professional conduct are covered by the standards for attorney sanctions on professional conduct, and they would be applicable here. Uh, the standards establish a level of discipline that's based on the type of misconduct, and they're used by the state bar court to recommend discipline. They're not binding on the California Supreme Court when ordering discipline, but they're typically followed by the Supreme Court unless there's grave doubts as to the propriety of the recommended discipline. In this instance, um, standard 2.19 would apply. It's somewhat of a catch-all standard and applies to violations of rules that are not otherwise, not otherwise um, specified in other standards. Um, for those who don't know, uh, discipline is determined by a number of factors, including, you know, factors surrounding the misconduct, any aggravating evidence, any mitigation evidence, um, but the range for discipline for our 8.3 violation on its own could be as low as a private reproval or as high as a three-year suspension, depending on several other factors. Um, one of the biggest Before questions- I apologize. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interrupt you, Trustee sure. uh, Stallings has a question. Yes. Hey, good afternoon, Erica. Thank you for your work on this. Um, I just had a question about the tracking of attorney complaints. Do you have those <clears throat> numbers in front of you? Um, and I guess the percentage of attorney complaints that are filed compared to other sorts of complaints, whether state bar court initiated, um, initiated through the judiciary or, um, or private individuals? So let me make sure I understand. So how many uh, lawyer filed complaints we get currently? Is that correct? Correct. Okay, yeah. So that's um, now on, now hopefully you can see it on your screen. That's three to 4% of all the complaints that are filed in California currently. So lawyers file three to 4% of those complaints. That's on par with um, the national average of lawyer filed complaints in the states that actually track it that we surveyed. So um, the states that have a version of 8.3 that also, again, track these stats, it's typically about 3 to 4% of their complaints are lawyer filed. On your screen, it shows 3 to 9 on average, and that's because Illinois is quite a bit higher than other jurisdictions, and we wanted to account for that as well. Um, so related to uh, Trustee Stallings, your question now, and some other trustees' questions back at the March meeting, um, the current number of lawyer filed complaints in California is consistent, like I said, with most other jurisdictions that already have a version of Rule 8.3. This can mean a variety of things. Uh, it can mean that California licensees are already reporting the conduct that would have to be reported if a version of Rule 8.3 is ultimately adopted. And it's also possible that it, it doesn't include those things and the number could go up. Um, currently, uh, complaints filed uh, in the discipline system 
fluctuate from year to year. Um, so we could, you know, assume that the numbers are doubled here. So if we go from 4% currently up to 8% if Rule 8.3 is ultimately adopted, that's still within the range, uh, the variance range of the number of complaints that OCTC already receives. Um, it goes up and down, you know, by a couple, a, a thousand or so from year to year. Um, and OCTC has indicated that it would, you know, fit within the existing workload based on that variance that's already staffed for, you know, from in the range of, let's say, 2018 to 2022 of those known complaints. I think, Erica, if um, maybe, uh, Brandon, if I understood you, you were asking about like the relative, the proportion that these complaints represent. And I, I, I don't think we have the specific data, but just looking at the 2022 ADR. So for example, total complaints filed, um, what we traditionally think of as complaints, 12,731, state bar initiated inquiries, 310, probation referral, 79, Reportable actions, self 183. Reportable actions, other that would include your court court referrals, a thousand something. I can't read without my glasses. Um, so that gives you a sense of the relative proportion. And when we are talking about three percent, we just modeled it off of a fifteen thousand complaint base because the math is easy there. So there you're talking about about four hundred and fifty complaints. So you can see it's a relatively small proportion. And what Erica is saying is the caseload um, fluctuates year to year. So that 450, give or take, um, it, it doesn't seem that it would significantly impact the workload over time of OCTC. But I know George is, can speak to that as well. Okay, I'm gonna move on just in the interest of time. Uh, okay. So um, staff is recommending that we um, that the board adopt alternative two to be submitted to the California Supreme Court for ultimate approval. And um, there's, there's several different reasons. So as you, you know, saw in the overview of the public comment, the majority of commenters are not in favor of a version of Rule 8.3. However, the majority of commenters that we, re that we receive comment from are um, attorneys. And that's not to be dismissive of the public commenters or dismissive of their position. But it, it does, um, a lot of the comments somewhat went against, you know, the, the Board of Trustees and the State Board's ultimate mission, which is um, to protect the public. Um, and that's supposed to be the highest priority. We think that staff recommend, or staff thinks that alternative two really strikes this balance. So the required um, conduct that must be reported is that conduct that is most likely to result in client harm or harm to a third party. It is not every violation of the rules of professional conduct that um, you know, is reflective of a lawyer's fitness to practice as is in model rule 8.3, but it's also not so narrow to only limit to really extreme misconduct like in alternative one. So we do think this kind of strikes an appropriate balance. Um, additionally, uh, the exceptions to the duty to report in the rule on the comments themselves also seem to be very helpful in this situation compared to, compared to the ABA model rule and really are reflective of um, some differences in California among other states um, in regards to addressing the timing in which um, someone should report, being able to um, delay reporting if it would be to the disadvantage of a client to protect the lawyer-client relationship, as well as addressing some of the um, concerns regarding weaponization of the rule and the filing of false and malicious complaints. So- Ms. I, believe, I apologize, this is, yeah. uh, this is Ruben. I have a question. Um, related to uh, what I think you just alluded to a little bit with respect to the, the heavy proportion of comments we received from attorneys versus uh, non-attorneys and members of the public. And I noted in the staff report that there was, uh, there was a mention of, I, I can't remember the exact wording, but essentially it sounded to me like there was robust, uh, there were robust efforts to, uh, to uh, get public comment. Could you share with the board just what some of those efforts were so that Folks understand. I think that you know, generally speaking, it's it's very hard for us to get um, members of the public who are you know consumers or not to to pay attention to some of these uh, rules. Sure, absolutely, and that's all um, based on the efforts of the communications team with the state bar. So, a dedicated website was created to kind of explain these proposals in um, in plain in plain language because it can be somewhat complicated and nuanced. 
Um, and so there was a dedicated website addressing that. They also, um, the communications team reached out to numerous stakeholders in existing, um, you know, email listservs and others that we have to try and reach out. They did a social media campaign regarding this, and they probably did many other things that I'm not currently listing here um, that uh, Teresa and her, her team could speak to better than I am. But um, there was significant um, outreach performed. It just did not um, result in, in comments from those groups. And, and I have the metrics here. So we did a paid um, and organic campaign. So our total impressions for this were 972,000. The clicks to our public comment form, 5,300. Views of the mini site that Erica referred to, 3,265. Clicks from the all licensee email, 1,200. Our cost per click, that's a metric we look at, social media posting, 46 cents. <laughs> and all of that resulted in 390 comments. So the, the uh, social media that we do is the main way that we seek public comment from the public as well as the email distributions to various um, sort of community-based organizations and other types of non-lawyer organizations. And, you know, we just have varying success in these efforts. Thank you, I think that's that's instructive and helpful, uh, at least for me. Uh, Trustee Noel, I see your hand went up. Yes, I have a, a question about uh, SB 42. Uh, uh, th is it true that it tracks the model rule 8.3? At this time, yes. So as, okay. as it's currently um, before the legislature, yes. And I think before I comment further, I would really like to hear um, from our uh, esteemed executive director about her, uh, what she has heard from the legislature about what they anticipate that uh, this board will do and what why they feel they need SB 42. And whatever else you want to comment on, Leah. Okay, thanks, Greg. You might, you might. Uh regret that. But um, Ruben, I'd love for you to jump in because you've had some conversation with Senator Umberg about it. And Bridget, feel free to come up because you've worked very closely with Senator Umberg's staff. I think the main message I'd like the board to hear on this is that we have at both the um, Ruben directly with the author, uh, Senator Umberg level and our at the staff level worked diligently to try to coordinate with the Senator on this. Um, I think what we've gotten from staff is some um, clarity about their lack of clarity about exactly where this is going. We have gotten feedback that they, there's a perception that the COPRAC version of the rule is too narrow. Um, and I think there is concern, and I, I believe Senator Umberg actually made this comment in uh, during the fee bill hearing about the state bar's actual ability to act. Uh, because I think there was a reference in that setting to the fact that twice before the bar has considered some version of uh, model rule 8.3 and rejected it. And so there was some skepticism about whether or not the bar would actually advance a proposal this time around. Um, I, I believe that was said at, during the fee bill hearing. So we've been working hard. We have gotten that feedback, the COPRAC version too narrow. Um, we, I, I think we've Got, even been told, and Bridget, you may confirm this, that the staff version isn't necessarily quite hitting the mark. Um, there are a few too many exceptions, is, is I believe what we've been told. Go ahead. Sure. Yeah. Please don't do this. Uh, yes, we have been keeping Senator Umberg's staff in, you know, in the loop the whole time as far as what COPRAX has been doing, inviting them to, part, or to, to know about what hearings they've had. We had a public hearing about it. Um, throughout this year and just kind of keeping them up to date on what the public comments say. Um, we haven't gotten specific feedback as far as what the issue is, but we have had some conversations with staff. And Leah, it, your recollection is right that they, they're concerned about the number of exceptions. We did kind of walk through with staff like what some of them were, some of the concerns I think we were able to address just by having a conversation about it. And we've continued to express our willingness to hear the concerns or if there's any particular thing that we can do in our part, um, but we haven't received any specific language or, you know, in any detail about what else we can do with our draft. 
Yeah, I think the only the only thing that I'll add to this piece of the conversation is that um, Senator Umberg seemed, you know, very uh, willing and appreciative of the process that we're going through, and, and essentially recognizing that COPRAC is an is an entity. The board ultimately is an entity, um, and we're going to go through the process that we're going through now. And ultimately, these rules do have to go to the Supreme Court. And uh, I believe that he and I sort of agreed. Okay, let's each take our processes and and see, you know, what how close we can get to some common some common ground. I'm confident that we can certainly do that in a way that gets us beyond where we've been, which is, as Leah just mentioned, has been sort of back to square one a couple of times. I would, I don't feel like that's where we're headed now, but the discussion among the trustees will and further inform that for sure. I mean, and ultimately whatever the court chooses to do, but I think it's important uh, to recognize and appreciate the work of COPRAC and the work of our communication staff. I mean, the numbers that, that Leah just recited to us are not insignificant. Um, and certainly, thank you to the nearly 800 people who who did take the time to share their opinions and, and with us and to inform our discussion. Um, it makes sense that a lot of them are attorneys, sure, um, but it also makes sense that we have to keep you know our public protection mission uh, in mind first and foremost. I see Trustee Sowell's hand up. Just a quick question. I. Uh... First of all, I just want to thank staff for the report and also so for following up on a number of the questions that uh, were uh, came out of the, I think, our March meeting. Um, my question is about fiscal impact. I have to admit that I was I was a little struck when I when I read uh, uh, the staff report that um, it appeared that um, there's a there's a suggestion that there would not be an increase in the number of complaints filed nor additional costs to OCTC. And um, that struck me um, as a little odd because it would seem to me that this, I guess on the natural that it would. Um, and I just, if, if staff could just talk maybe a little bit more about how, how they see that. Sure, so I don't think, um, apologies if, that, if that's how it came across. I don't think we're saying there's not necessarily going to be more complaints. I think it's certainly a possibility. I think there's a lot of unknowns here and that I think is a challenge to um, successfully forecast as far as the fiscal impact um, to OCTC. So what we're looking at is currently we have a three to 4% rate of lawyer file complaints. Uh, you know, it's possible that we go as high as, as Illinois, which is the highest state of those we were able to survey and get real data from. Um, and we end up at, you know, eight to 9%. That would essentially double the number of complaints that we already that we receive from lawyers. Um, so doubling that, if we receive about 450 currently to 500 a year, we're now looking at 900 to 1,000 about. So what we were speaking to is, um, and, and Leah was just speaking to a moment ago, is that's already within the current range of complaints that are filed with OCTC that fluctuate from year to year. Because we, we don't, um, we're not able to obviously predict how many complaints are going to be filed. So it's already within the range that, co that I'm sorry, that OCTC is currently staffed for. There was a higher uh, number of complaints, you know, 2018, 2019. Those numbers have somewhat declined over the past couple of years as far as the number of complaints. So it's possible that we could go back up to those, you know, 2018, 2019 complaint numbers based on this. And that's still the level that OCTC is staffed at. Uh, George, while you're coming up, I just want to let the board know I've asked Louisa and Erica, so you know, to pull up, uh, get ready to share the 2022 ADR so we can look at that complaint fluctuation that is being referenced. So it, it sounds like or looks like uh, Mr. Cardona is going to offer some further information in answer to Trustee Sowell's question. Uh, Leah has asked for additional information, uh, I think, in the same vein. And then after that, we've got Trustee Shelby, who raised her hand here in the room, and Trustee Good on the Zoom. So, uh, Mr. Cardona, please. Yeah, I mean, I, I will I will just add to the difficulty in predicting this, um, because the, the numbers that were cited, so, for example, in fiscal year 2022, according to the ADR, we had 12,731 complaints, as opposed to 183 reportable actions self. Those self-reportable actions, we don't expect to change because those are things that people are required to report under the other statute. Um, so we already include in the complaint some number of complaints that we get from attorneys. For example, complaints that we get from opposing counsel who complain about things that, they're, uh, that the attorney on the other side has done or other types of complaints. Um, the, other, the other uncertainty is that um, you know, we often, um, in a case, for example, where an opposing attorney complains, we may also get a complaint um, from a client 
Um, and so there's an overlap sometimes. In other words, we get duplicate complaints, one from an attorney, one from a client. So again, that makes it very hard to predict um, what any increase is going to be in terms of complaints resulting from 8.3. Also, the final thing is that right now, attorneys have the discretion to report, and so it's hard to predict what a mandatory reporting rule will trigger as opposed to discretionary reporting right now in terms of what to expect in terms of increased complaint numbers. Just, just On that note, Mr. Cardona or, or Ms. Doherty, if you, if you know, um, for, this, for the large, largest or most comparable states that do have a rule that requires mandatory reporting, do we know data on when they adopted that rule and whether it, it resulted in significant increases in complaints to be? Uh, and, and I understand that's sort of in the weeds, but if we have that data, I'd like to know. Um, so I can briefly address that. Illinois is the, is the closest. Um, and so it wasn't the adoption of Rule 8.3 in Illinois that actually resulted in a higher rate of complaints being filed. It was the first discipline case regarding Rule 8.3 that resulted in the uptick in complaints that has kind of stayed about the same since then. So 8.3 in Illinois has been around for a very long, um, a long time. And then, um, you know, we're talking in the, I believe it was the 80s. And then um, the case, uh, the Himmel case, is what resulted in discipline for an 8.3 violation. And once that case, the publicity surrounding that case led to an uptick in the complaints. Um, in that year, you know, again, 1980s, it went from about 120 something to complaints to 900 in that jurisdiction. Um, and then it, which is about the eight to nine percent, and it's since stayed at about that rate consistently since then. And that's how long they've been tracking it for in Illinois. Thank you. Leah, did you still want to put some data up? Luis is going to share just a page from the ADR, hopefully. So if you can see, we're just looking at cases received right now, just to see the fluctuation. Um, so you can see in 2018, we had 15,428, 2019, 16,541, 2020, 15,700, 2021, 13,781, 2022, 14,497. And this is a bigger universe than just um, the what we categorize as a pure complaint, but this is all the kind of cases received by OCTC. So when we're talking about perhaps doubling the number of complaints coming pursuant to this rule, you're talking about a number of no more than 450, maybe 400. And you can see that there's that level of fluctuation year to year anyway. So that's all I think we've been saying. There's a lot of fluctuation in the caseload. So I think it's difficult, Arnie, to say that there's a fiscal impact uh, necessarily associated with this rule. Um, because even if we, if we double the level of attorney filed complaints to, uh, today, we're talking about four to 500 and there's that level of fluctuation anyway. If I could just real quick, just a quick follow-up and that it, and, and, and totally understand and I appreciate seeing this in terms of that, that uncertainty uh, sort of factor that's, that's here. Um, can, can you speak to the, how this might affect our backlog though? Even though we, we may be you know, able to intake all these cases, are we going to actually be able to get through them? We're looking at Mr. Cardona. I mean, that's a more complicated question. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I mean, we'll be getting to our, you know, our, our statistical report um, later in the meeting. Um, but as you'll see from that, you know, our backlog um, in terms of the number of cases that are pending at the end of the first quarter of 2023 that are outside the time limits that are currently set. Um, has increased, and you'll note a trend of that increasing across time. Um, so I can't say that the number of cases would not potentially increase our impact, but I think what Leah is saying is correct, which is that, you know, the variation in the number of cases is within what we see as kind of the normal variation over time across cases. Um, you know, there are, again, when we look at the statistics, you'll see that our our inventory at any given time goes up and down in part based on how we get cases coming in and the number of cases we get coming in varies depending on a, a number of factors that go well beyond this particular rule. Um, so it's even harder to predict exactly what any impact on the backlog might be from this. 
Trustee Sowell, is that good? Yes, thank you. Thank you, sir. Trustee Shelby. Thank you. I appreciate uh, Mr. Cardona, the response in relation to backlog. That was one of my questions. The other was, how does this um, intersect with civility? I know that we've been having a conversation with civility and will, will this have any sort of impact on civility? Um, I can try to address that as well, Trustee Shelby. Please, yes. Um, so, the, so there are two sets of rules basically being proposed um, on slightly separate paths. So this is rule 8.3, which ad addresses um, some types of misconduct that, that a lawyer would be required to report against another lawyer. Certainly, some of those things could also be things that constitute incivility under the other rules that are being proposed, um, including changes to um, rule 1.2, 8.4, and 8.4.2, which we'll actually be talking about um, momentarily in a different agenda item. Uh, in both alternatives one and um, alternative two, neither one explicitly calls out a duty to report incivility. However, there are certain things that may have some overlap within what's in alternative two. So, you know, uh, dishonesty, deceit, fraud, some of those things certainly could be tied to uncivil behavior, but um, it's not necessarily something that would be required to be reported under any of the alternatives being proposed. Um, conversely, under uh, ABA Model Rule 8.3, if something like that were to be adopted, be it through SB 42 or be it by this board and ultimately the Supreme Court, that just requires um, the reporting of a violation of any of the rules of professional conduct that have a um, that are substantially related to the lawyer's uh, fitness, essentially. So that rule, if adopted, there's an argument to be made there that a violation of um, 8.4.2, again, if that is adopted, could require a lawyer to report upon another lawyer, again, if the model rule is adopted. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Good, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I had a question about not necessarily the volume of cases, but the quality of the cases referred to or complaints that are made to OCTC presently uh, by lawyers. So I know the statistic is three to four percent um, we also know, and Leah's chart, you know, showed that explicitly, and I'm well acquainted with it from my work on the ad hoc commission on the disciplinary process, that many complaints result in no action being taken. Um, can we say, for example, that lawyer complaints currently, those that are made voluntarily, the 3 to 4 percent, result in a higher yield of disciplinary ca cases going forward? Um, or not, or, or, or is that data just not available? I was just curious because to the extent that it, it does more do go forward, it tends to support the proposition that this kind of rule is very important in terms of protecting the public and um, uh, requiring lawyers who have a special and kind of privileged position to observe conduct by other lawyers um, have the ability to kind of report this. So it's probably more for Mr. Cardona, I would think. Thank you. Exactly. I, I don't have the data, um, which I don't know if Erica has pulled that data. Um, I'm not sure. Um, I can tell you that as a general matter, when we get complaints from attorneys, they tend to be more thorough um, and there's more provision of supporting documents so that it makes it easier for us to review them and make a determination as to whether there's something there that should be the subject of discipline or not. Um, I don't have the numbers on relative percentages of those that move forward um, as compared to complaints from other parties. I, I do agree with Trustee Good that that's a, that's a um, I appreciate the tenor of the question and I, I think it would be uh, information that, that would be good to know. I think Erica, because I know you mentioned to me, Erica, there is that data available from other states. Correct. So Illinois, again, um, the, the state with the most information on this topic also tracks that data. Um, and what we're looking at is basically a conversion rate, right? So we're looking at the, the percentage of complaints that are filed by lawyers that convert to disciplinary charges that are filed. Um, and they do track that. And in Illinois, there's a much higher conversion rate. So they have, um, you know, uh, lawyer file complaints make up, depending on the year, between 8% and about 11% of the total number of complaints that are filed. The conversion rate for those on the low end was about 20%. So it was 20% of all cases that were filed against a lawyer, all the way up to in certain years, you know, it was like, I think it was 47%. 
So obviously it fluctuates a lot, but I do think it, it does speak to the fact that either the complaints are better presented or they have um, better information within them that can lead to um, the disciplinary authority in Illinois filing a complaint, um, I'm sorry, filing disciplinary charges against a lawyer in that jurisdiction. Thank you, Ms. Doherty. Trustee Noll, please. Thank you. Um, at, at, at the risk of exposing my my childhood, I just I I, I know why lawyers don't want this. I mean, I I was always told you 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 don't rat out people, but Trustee Good, I think with her question and with her comment hit it right on the head as, as, as many of you have, including the chair. I think we have a moral uh, obligation as we sit in our privileged uh, position in society uh, to make a decision on this um, that we think is uh, the best for the public um, and takes into consideration um, our, uh, our <laughs> litigious nature, but I, uh, I am concerned that uh, I would, I would, I think, look favorably on the staff's recommendation. Um, but if that is approved by the Supreme Court, this is going to have to be a rule, in my view that is going to have to be really managed by maybe not us, but certainly staff in terms of uh, frivolous complaints or complaints that are uh, coming out of litigation. And, and, and I mean, I can, I can see it right now. Um, it, it, I, I can just see it. Um, you know, I'm sure a lot of my staff are sitting around waiting for this to pass so they can file something against uh, people that they have litigated against, and particularly in unlawful detainer cases and things like that. I am, uh, uh, but I am, I am persuaded that we must do something, and. Uh, uh, I think Umberg thinks we're not going to do anything, and I think we should uh, give him something to think about with uh, SB 42. That's, that's all I have to say. But thank you, uh, Trustee Good, for your comment. Thank you, Trustee Noel. As you as you uh, talk and, and as Trustee Shelby um, raised the potential overlap with the civility rule that we're also going to be considering and the work that's been done by that uh, that task force. Uh, it just reinforces to me the interconnectedness of everything that we're doing here uh, at the bar. Um, that question. Yes. And I'm proud of the work. No matter what happens, I'm proud of the work. Um, Trustee Stallings and then Trustee Tony, please. All right, thank you. And Greg touched on this uh, briefly, but um, my question is, is there a rule in place that um, or a rule of professional conduct in place that would um, allow OCTC to uh, punish a, a lawyer who makes a false complaint or a false allegation or who is overly litigious in this area? Uh, yes, so that's actually cross-referenced in one of the comments to the rule. It's by statute and there's, um, there's criminal penalties for it. So um, as far as uh, uh, George, you may have to speak to how that would be pursued um, in OCTC, but it's certainly something that could be, I think, coordinated with um, ex external bodies as well as ultimately perhaps pursued by OCTC as well. Yes, so that could that could constitute a violation of, of one of the of, of a provision that we could prosecute. We also, as a disciplinary violation, we also would have the ability to, as Erica noted, it is a criminal violation, so we also have the ability to make re referrals to law enforcement. And then do we have a sense, just as a follow-up, of the amount of um, these types of cases that we currently uh, file or go after and the efficacy of, of such investigations? 
So I, I think that's related to uh, Trustee Good's question, which is what's the percentage of, of cases fought, of complaints filed by attorneys that actually result in prosecution. I, I don't have the numbers for us, but I think Erica gave the numbers for Illinois um, to suggest that there is a fairly high follow-through rate on those. Um, I will just note that you know, right now attorneys have the ability to address uh, Trustee Broughton's comments. Attorneys are not precluded from filing complaints. It's just that there's no mandatory obligation. Um, so the, the, you know, we, we do see sometimes um, complaints filed by opposing counsel that uh, we don't proceed on that appear to be um, you know, not, not have any merit. Great, thank you. Thank you both. Trustee Tony, please. Thank you. We, um, this is a proposal that I believe would make a very important, significant contribution to protecting the public. Um, one of the things that I think about with new policies, when you're thinking about adopting them, so one question is, what does success look like? I ask myself that question. And I think success would look like there would be more complaints filed by attorneys, okay? That's what success would look like. If we have the same number as before, it's kind of like, why bother? So I think that it is a reasonable expectation because we expect success in this, requiring attorneys instead of just they can do it if they feel like it, but requiring them to report misconduct under you know these various um, criteria would result in some increase in um, in complaints filed. Otherwise, I'm I'm kind of like it's a failure. But I believe this will be a success. Okay, that is my assumption, my expectation. With that presumption, I'm going to bring up a topic and theme I am going to bring up all through the meeting, and that is one of fiduciary duty that we bear as trustees, particularly when we are in a financial crisis. I think we all agree and understand we are in a financial crisis. So, of course, fiduciary duty exists no matter what, but especially when you're in a financial crisis, when there are before us other proposals on the agenda about making deep cuts, significant cuts to other protection of the public um, areas. And there are other proposals asking us to approve more allocation of funds. I think the part on the agenda, the fiscal and personnel impact is important for us to know before we take a vote. It doesn't mean that we won't look at it and decide, you know what? The additional cost is worth it. But I am not comfortable in voting for any proposal in which I have no estimate of the fiscal impact, particularly when we're in such a cut. Um, so, I, I um, that is an, so that's one concern. And the, the second concern is I serve, along with my colleague, Trustee Cisneros, on the OTC um, Oversight Committee. And we, we do meet regularly with, uh, with uh, George Cardona, and uh, I appreciate you bringing up the, the fact that the backlog is increasing, not decreasing. And I can't uh, help but believe if we have more complaints without additional resources, that we keep the same resources, which are insufficient to even keep up with what we have now, then it's just simple, simple arithmetic that it will simply add. So I, I just want you to know that I, you know, it, 
we've got to balance these things. And um, I would like one of two things. Either we see that there is a fiscal impact that we can look at and maybe put this off until tomorrow so we can get an estimate of what that is. Um, because my willingness to support this would have to do with a provision that says that it takes effect. Right now, the proposal is it takes effect when it's um, as quickly as possible once the Supreme Court approves it. I would, I would say that it takes effect when um, the State Bar is funded to adequately do it. It is n not responsible to adopt or to um, encourage the legislature or the governor's office to impose unfunded mandates. Thank you, Trustee Tony, uh, Trustee Benaventura, and then Trustee Noll. Th thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I have some concerns. I, although I, I think we're all in agreement that protection of the public is our central purpose um, as an organization. What, what I'm struggling with is some of the comments that were made by some of the people on the survey about weaponizing um, this issue. And, and, and I try to think of it practically, what would happen in the real world? So if you have a lawyer who makes a complaint against another lawyer, I think that's necessarily gonna make that other lawyer file a complaint against that second lawyer. And so I, when I think about complaints, as Mr. Tony said, complaints are good. Complaints are good when they come from the public. But I'm not sure complaints between lawyers, back and forth, you know, we have an adversarial system. We fight. That's what we do. And so I'm not sure increasing the fight, the complaints, the weaponizing, of complaints against each other will serve the public interest in the way that we want it to uh, be better for them. Um, so I think my, my first question is, maybe to Mr. Cardona, the, the cases that you've handled where there have been lawyer complaints against another lawyer, do you see um, evidence of that second lawyer filing like a counter complaint and sort of just the going, them going back and forth and adding more to the fighting, the incivility of it, the weaponizing of this kind of procedure. So I, I don't have statistical data, but anecdotally, I would say that no, that's not a common thing. Um, if we see complaints from attorneys, it's typically a complaint from one side. We don't necessarily see the reciprocal complaint coming back. But again, that's just anecdotal. I haven't looked at any data. Okay. If I can, I would just also note that the rule as proposed by staff requires reporting only when there is credible evidence. Mm -hmm. When the attorney has credible evidence of um, under alternative two, what would be fairly serious violations. So the type of kind of petty back and forth over, you know, you missed this deadline, therefore I'm going to file a state bar complaint. Um, I would hope that we wouldn't start seeing that. Well, so th the situation I, I think about is when someone claims you're dishonest about something. Anybody can say that, really. And you could just say, well, then you're dishonest about this. And it just sort of just keep going back and forth. Yeah, I mean, anecdotally, again, we haven't seen that. Okay. And then, um, let, let me, let me let, uh, try to be clear about something. Without passage of any of these rules, there's nothing to prevent an attorney now from filing complaints if they believe that the other attorney has been dishonest or deceitful, right? 
That's correct. Right now, attorneys, just like any other member of the public, have the ability to submit a complaint um, alleging a violation of the rules of professional conduct of the State Bar Act. It's discretionary. It's not, not required under any circumstances. Okay. And so is what we're trying to do is to get ahead on the Senate bill ultimately passing and making our own recommendation? I, I don't think that's the incentive behind this. I think the incentive behind this is that sometimes attorneys may be in the best position to observe serious violations of the type that are contained in, in Alternative 2. I'll focus on Alternative 2 since that's the one that staff proposed. Yeah. Sometimes attorneys are in the best position to, re to observe those and, uh, and have the information of what other attorneys are doing. Um, and there can be uh, an inherent reluctance to exercise discretion and make an affirmative choice to report. This would impose a duty in situations where an attorney actually has credible evidence of what are serious violations, a duty to report that. The hope is that that would bring to our attention um, through sources that otherwise might not choose to report um, violations that are, you know, among the more serious violations that we see and among the more serious violations that actually do pose serious risks to the public. So I think that's what underlies um, the, the motivation for proposing in particular Alternative 2, which does limit the reporting obligation to the more serious types of violations. Can, can you tell me which which rule or law would supersede one another? Um, so um, I, I can, I mean, my view, and I'll, I'll defer to our Office of General Counsel if they disagree, but if, you know, if the Supreme Court passes a rule and then the legislature passes a statute, if the statute is broader than the rule, the broad would supersede, the rule, the statute would supersede and attorneys would be obligated to report in accordance with the statute, okay. even though that reporting obligation was far broader than the rule. All right, understood. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Certainly, and I'll, I'll just uh, augment one of the answers George gave with respect to Trustee Buenaventura's question about the, the timing, for lack of a better word. Um, uh, when I made the request of COPRAC to take a look at Model Rule 8.3, there was no legislative proposal yet uh, begun. So there was a state bar that initiated this process, not to take anything away from Senator Umberg because certainly I think he's doing a great job at judiciary, but this, this, there, there's not a race necessarily. I think we've got some good concurrent procedures happening now. All right. A uh, bunch of hands went up. So uh, Trustee Noel, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I wanted to uh, respond to Trustee Tony's uh, uh, view on this, I, I'm normally I'm, I'm I'm pretty much aligned with, with with his thinking, but this time I'm kind of the reverse. Um, I think the reality is uh, that this year uh, the legislature believes that because of all of the uh, things that were uncovered. There's got to be some punishment of us, I guess. Um, it, it's the following year, uh, I think, that is our biggest chance for a large increase year. And um, it also would give us time to have data under this rule to show cost of implementation to us. And uh, if, if it is increased, um, uh, uh, and, and in any event, uh, I heard our executive director give us an estimate of the cost that you're asking for. She said there would be no increase in cost. And the reason she gave, which makes sense, is because our total complaints are up and down every year between 11,000 and 15,000 and 14 and 13. And, and, and so even if there was a, a good increase in, in these types of complaints, which as our, our council told us are always better prepared and easier to, 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 uh, uh, to uh, figure out and, and, and make decisions on, that that 
it would not impact overall unless also all the other complaints were, you know, now, now we're at 18,000. But, but that's, that's just the nature of the numbers of complaints and how they changed. They changed so much that this one, uh, in her estimation and her staff's estimation, is not going to result in more costs maybe more complaints of this nature, but not necessarily more cost. And I don't know what more we want to ask of her in terms of giving us uh, an estimate when she's already done that. Um, I mean, I, I'm just, I, I'm, I'm just saying that, that that happened and I heard it and I, you know, um, I think that we could um, uh, make a decision uh, on this uh, based on, on on her recommendation or uh, her estimate of no no additional cost, and um, uh, we can take it from there. I think it would uh, uh, be an important, uh, and I don't I don't mind waiting till tomorrow. I mean I don't. That that part I don't, I, I don't have any. I think we should not leave this weekend without uh, making a strong statement about how we believe that this is a protection for the public, and this is how we think is the best way to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Noel. So your, your commentary reminds me um, that uh, Ms. Doherty is being extremely patient because if I'm not mistaken, she was in the middle of her presentation. We, she had taken some questions and the questions naturally led to what um, I think is <laughs> going to shape up to be a, a, a robust debate here at the board. Um, but I did want to give Erica the opportunity to, to finish your, your presentation if there is indeed more uh, material to provide before we can continue uh, the debate uh, that's that seems to have been started already. Not, All right, thank you. I want the, the trustees to ask questions, but certainly let's get the let's get the uh, the report done and the questions asked before we debate. Sure, right, thank you. Um, we were very close to the end, so this is the last slide, other than the um, proposed resolutions. So very quickly, in either alternative one or alternative two, whatever um, the board decides to, to vote on today, but certainly as it relates to alternative two, um, there are two non-substantive revisions that are being proposed, and I just wanted to briefly go over those so that the board is aware. Um, first is a minor change to paragraph C to um, change the word crime to criminal act. There were some commenters that um, suggested that those two things can mean different things. And we wanted to be clear that um, we are trying to exempt from the duty to report something that would constitute a criminal act in another state that would not be within California. Um, another commenter, um, a couple commenters actually suggested a minor revision to comment three, which is to provide additional cross-references to other rules. So what that comment three, is, um, describes is um, when a lawyer must report, and that is um, when they would not materially prejudice or damage the interests of a client of the lawyer or a client of the lawyer's firm. Um, and then in determining that, there are cross-references to other rules, which includes the duty to communicate, the material limitation conflict, and then what has been added is the responsibilities of a managerial or supervisorial lawyer and a subordinate lawyer. So those conversations can happen um, between a, you know, a, a first year attorney who thinks they have an obligation to report, uh, a senior lawyer who also knows there's an obligation to report, but as far as the timing of when to report so as to not prejudice the client, that's what it's meant to, cross, to provide reference to. And with that, I just have the resolution so I can move those onto the screen or I can just stop sharing um, so everyone can see each other for the conversation. Why don't we stop sharing because right. there were a couple of other trustees whose hands were raised. Uh, I don't know whether for questions or debate, the hands have gone, but they're still there. Uh, Trustee Broughton. Thank you. I, I apologize. I really wanted to be here for this whole discussion. I got a call from the presiding judge here just before we got back into session. There's apparently a judge behaving badly, and we had to sort of have a discussion about what we're going to be doing about that. So I needed to go over there. Is there a duty to report that conduct? Um, <laughs> a judge? <laughs> I don't know. 
<laughs> well, but this this um, particular subject, this rule um, troubles me. I, I really don't know um, which side of the fence I am going to be falling on it presently. Um, I do know that it does feel somewhat Orwellian to me that I, as a licensee, now am to be a mandatory reporter, if you will, um, and as one of our other trustees put it, a um, 